Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our fourth work, uh, pre-event workshop. This one is being presented by eWorld and it is a uh, some information on the service now and a um, uh, whatever you called it, a an example. What did you call it? A workshop or a demo? No, 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 no. You're gonna you're gonna show them how to use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, for some reason, my brain just forgot the word. I welcome to my world. I'm getting old. Oh well. Anyway, so uh, this is going to be a really fun event. Um, we have this is the fourth of three pre-event workshops. Uh, please be aware I have posted the recordings and most of the slides. I will have the rest of the slides uh, by tomorrow uh, on the Hack website. So if you missed any of those, please go back and check them out, um, as well as any uh, trainings from previous years. These are going to be great things to help you with the hack event this year. Okay, I'm going to turn it over now to Steve Stephen Chen and uh, allow him to work his magic. Over to you, Steve. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'll go ahead and share my screen, and then we'll do screen two. All right, and making sure, yep, chat's still up for me, and then I'm going to pull the participants list as well. Okie dokie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Chan, and um, today we're going to be doing a really quick work session about building low-code, no-code solutions within the ServiceNow platform. And then really quick, just to kind of introduce myself, um, my name is Stephen Chan. I'm a lead ServiceNow developer here at eWorld. Uh, I've joined, joined the company at the beginning of this year, but I've been working on the platform for roughly eight years. Um, and then in the middle is just my LinkedIn link, a little plug there if you want to connect with me as well. And so today we're going to be talking about a couple of key things. Um, one is what is ServiceNow? Two is to provide some developer resources for everyone. Um, what is low-code, no-code? And then at the very end, we're going to be doing kind of a technical demo. I'm going to actually be building a small little application in front of everyone. Um, just to kind of show you the the breadth and the tool of ServiceNow and just to show off some of the capabilities of the tool set. So really quick, you know, what is ServiceNow? ServiceNow is a cloud-based SaaS solution, which is software as a service, or I guess they do uh, platform as a service. And um, it does a lot of the, it, it's like a really strong ticketing system. So there's a lot of components that are built at the very middle level here. This is called the Now Platform. And within the Now Platform, there's a lot of components that help with building a great product. So automation, um, they've been acquiring and integrating AI and machine learning. They have low-code, no-code editors and builders, and they have security rules and everything. And from there, you can actually build different types of workflows on top of this engine. So ServiceNow traditionally sells um, modules, so ITSM, IT ma uh, service management, which handles incident management, change management, problem management, and et cetera, as well as other technologies like HR and contract management and software asset management. I'm not going to go too much into the details because I'm not a sales guy. I'm mostly a developer and engineer, so I like the more technical things. So before we dive too far into this, I guess the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, what is low code, no code, and, you know, why do we hear it so much? And low code, no code is just a way for companies to kind of leverage tool sets to bring developer tools to the general public, to make it a little easier for users to kind of jump on board the platform and help develop tools for the enterprise. And so a lot a lot more recently, there's been a lot of tools or a lot of platforms that have been pushing low-code, no-code capabilities because there's not a lot of developers within the enterprise to help push initiatives. There's usually a large backlog of things that we need to do to help digitally transform our business or transform our processes. But usually the developers are bogged down. There's a lot of work to do. There's never, never enough time in the year to get through our backlog. And so they've introduced these concepts for low-code, no-code, where you can provide tool sets to citizen developers or folks within the organization 
to help build some of these tool capabilities in conjunction with a developer or an administrator. So you can see here, low code being kind of on the far left here, there, low code is in the middle and then citizen developers are kind of on the left side. So that those are folks that are within different disciplines or business stakeholders that know a lot about their process, um, but they don't know how to code things from scratch. They can use this tool set to help take their process and digitize it in a way that we can get them off of spreadsheets, off of the uh, paper and pencil routes and into a more technical solution for them. So here I have a couple of developer resources that would help kind of newcomers to the ServiceNow space to kind of learn and to play around within ServiceNow. Uh, I'm going to post these links into the chat. I have it in my notepad over here. And so these are all documentation and free resources that ServiceNow provides to help kind of accelerate your learning with the platform and give you tools and capabilities to kind of try and, and learn how to use this tool set. And so to sign up for this, um, you would have to sign up for a ServiceNow ID account. And you can basically sign up for this account from any of those links. They're all kind of an SSO solution. So by signing up to Now Learning or Developer, you'd be able to log in to the other application as well too. Uh, the account is completely free. So just feel free to sign up for an account. This is just me kind of demoing me signing up my developer account. And then there's a couple of sites that I kind of want to highlight. This one is called Now Learning. ServiceNow provides ad hoc courses and a nice expansion, uh, not a nice large catalog of different courses within ServiceNow to teach you how to use the mechanism, how to build the process, how to use the tool to kind of solve your business problems. So today's lab or workshop is actually designed around their citizen developer app engine class. And then at the same time, if you go over to developer.servicenow.com, you can actually sign up and register and get a free personal instance, which is available for about 10 days. Um, as long as you keep working within the instance, the ex expiration of that instance will continue to continually push back. And then whenever you're not using the instance, the instance will actually hibernate. So it helps kind of conserve resources for other developers uh, to kind of use this free developer resource. So this, uh, this test instance is the full-fledged instance. You can actually install um, all the different modules within ServiceNow. For example, you can uh, install Integration Hub um, or any other applications that you're really interested in learning like HR or project management. Um, and it's just the full tool, but it's for learning and for experimenting and for testing. So for administrators like me or developers like me, we often have our own, we call them PDIs, personal development instances. We usually have them running in parallel with everything because if we're learning something, if we're trying to experiment on something, we'll typically test it in our PDIs uh, before we roll it out into our own enterprise development instances. So uh, just a really short slide deck to kind of introduce everything and, and talk about some of the concepts. Um, so I much prefer the technical demo. So I'm going to go straight into that. So let's go ahead. Oops, skip too far ahead. Let's go ahead and skip right over to the technical demo. So here I'm currently logged into one of my personal development instances. Um, so when you get it, you get assigned a random number. And then this instance is for you to kind of play around with. It's good for 10 days as long as you continuously develop within the instance, the renewal date gets pushed back, um, and you can kind of extend it indefinitely. Until... Einstein said insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. This is precisely what you're doing, bro. What okay. the fuck are you thinking? Jake, get off the line. Interesting. I'm going to anyway. kick you out if you do that again. All right, that was interesting. All right, so um, now that I'm in my personal development instance here, um, we're gonna go and roll over to the App Engine Studio. So you can see that they kind of advertise that in the very front in the beginning. 
Um, but if you're working in a customer instance or you're working in your own enterprise instance, you can actually go down to the filter and go to the App Engine Studio from here as well too. So let's go ahead and open that up. And you can see here, I've been kind of experimenting with the applications, making sure everything kind of works. Um, so we're going to build kind of a parallel application in conjunction with this so one here. I'm not a physics major, but I know that a grenade this big is not getting through a hole this big. What the fuck is this, dude? I see. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Oh, I see. All right. So let's press on. Okay. So from here, we're going to go ahead and create a new application. So let's go ahead and hit create application here. Okay. Give that a little bit too low. And then once it's loaded, let's go ahead and give this application a name. So let's go ahead and call this library v2. And then I've kind of pasted things here on the side for me to quickly paste these and move on with the demo. Let's go ahead and continue. This is the best ranch I have ever tasted in my entire life. Jinxie, this young dash driver, I nutted it in the ranch. Okay, so we're just gonna go ahead and build some of these rows out. I bet some witty comments here. Hit continue. All right. So once we've created our application, we're going to go ahead and click back into the app dashboard here. And from here, um, we're given a couple of mechanisms here or categories here that we can kind of go through. Um, you can see they've sorted this out by on the top here, data, experience, logic, automation, and security. So they kind of want us to kind of go through this guided experience of what we need to add for our application. With any application, you have kind of a data set that you need to provide. Oftentimes you'll get this in the form of a spreadsheet. Sometimes you'll get them in the form of a text file or an export from some legacy system that we had. So let's go ahead and add a new data table. And for this example, while that's loading, um, let's go ahead and prep that data. So what I've done here is I've had chat GPT because I love trying to use new technologies and things uh, generate me kind of a data set. And so I've asked it for a data set about books. And so for here, I've created a data set from chat GPT. I'm going to go ahead and paste it into the spreadsheet. And you can see here that sometimes, and this happens a lot in real life, is that the data set that you get is not perfectly clean. It doesn't really fit into your spreadsheets or your mechanisms perfectly well. So we're going to go ahead and take this data set. We're going to go ahead and transform it with Excel. So we're going to say we're going to get this from, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. It was this one here. Oh, no, that's the wrong button. Sorry, it's right here. So text to column. Oh, X. All right. And I'm going to say it's limited with commas. And I'm going to go ahead and finish that. So that cleans up our spreadsheet. And let's go ahead and save that. And we'll just call this book one. Let's put that in downloads. So now we've got our data set all flushed out. Let's go ahead and import this into ServiceNow. Let's go ahead and import the spreadsheet that we've just created. Go ahead and add that spreadsheet, book one. And then we're going to go ahead and check this box here to make sure we import that data from our spreadsheet. Continue. 
And so we're given a couple of options. One is, do we want to create a new table from our spreadsheet or do we want to use an existing table? In this case here, we're going to go ahead and create a new table. And then we're given another option down here to either create a brand new table from scratch or we can extend from an existing table to extend functionality or other mechanisms from tables. So ServiceNow has this really interesting thing where you can inherit um, different parts from other tables. So for example, a lot of the applications built in ServiceNow is built on the task table, which allows us to do approvals, to do um, SLA, uh, SLAs, and a bunch of other cool mechanisms that are pre-built into the platform. And so if you wanted to extend some of that capabilities into your own application without having to reinvent the wheel, um, you could actually extend the task table or any other table within ServiceNow that's allowable. So in this case, which we're just going to go ahead and create a very simple new table from scratch. And then you can see here it has translated some of our fields from the spreadsheet. So let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. I like to make sure that things are properly capitalized. So let's do that. Make sure author is capital A, and then title. And then this one will be in all caps, like so. And then the publish date, let's just change this to a string. Um, in the spreadsheet, this is loaded as a year. So we'll just go ahead and capture that in a string. And then we'll leave everything else as is. Go ahead and hit continue. And then let's give our new table a name. So let's call go ahead and call this a book table and then we'll leave everything else as is. So if you wanna make your table extendable, so that means you're making some sort of core logic that you would like to extend into other future tables, you would check the make extendable. That way you can build a lot of core logic within this table and then build other tables on top of that to inherit that logic onto that table. In this case, we're gonna keep it really simple. We're gonna make, make sure that's unchecked. And then if you want to have a numbering system, you could have auto number, which allows the system to automatically create an index number for that particular uh, entry. So this would say book 00010000, but in this case, we'll leave that blank as well too. And let's go ahead and hit continue. And then it's gonna ask us for some rows. So let's give the librarian pretty much all the access to this table, and then we'll give the users just read and write access to this particular table. Hit continue. Give that a couple of seconds to load the data. It's going to rip it from the spreadsheet and then create the table and then populate the table with that data. So once that's done, we'll go ahead and modify a form. We'll go ahead and create a service catalog item to make it easy for end users to check out a book. And then we'll create flows and automation behind that. So hopefully this will load pretty soon. Hopefully it's not having uh, issues with the internet because I've been having that pretty much all day today. I think this is going to take a little bit. So let's go ahead and um, I'm going to use an existing application because I think there's some issues. I'll go ahead and cancel this right now. And that's why you build backups. So let's go ahead and switch over to my pre built application here, having some issues with it generating. So in this example that I've built out before um, is the same thing. I have a book table here. And within the book table, let's go ahead and pull out the preview for this. Okay. 
Um, this is called the table builder. And so this is a way for us to really quickly add columns, make changes to them, um, make things display values. Um, but here we're going to go ahead and hit preview just to kind of show what that table looks like today. And you can see here um, we have a couple of books. We have five books here, two of which are available and three of which are checked out. So um, let's go ahead and click into the form. And so the form is whenever you interact with records within ServiceNow, it typically comes with a form that you can interact with as a user. And so here I've kind of designed the form to have the ID at the top left-hand corner, the availability on the far right here, and the title on the bottom. So if you go ahead and preview this form, um, this is what the form will look like. And if you ever get requirements to add more fields or move things around, it's pretty easy to do so from the editor. So for example, let's say I want to switch the number with the um, availability. Let's go ahead and just switch the boxes around real quick. So we'll drag this here and drag and drop this up here as well. And we'll hit save. And so once that is safe, if I go ahead and preview this, you can see it will switch the boxes around once everything decides to, let's just go ahead and open up in platform. Yep, and you can see it switched the two fields around. All right, so let's go over creating catalog items within ServiceNow. So I've actually already created one here, but let's just create one in parallel with it. So let's go ahead and add a new one. And you can see that we're given a couple of options for the experience that we're going to create. Workspaces are a way for fulfillers or for users that will complete the request to interact with the ticket. The standard catalog item is a way for users to request goods and services. Um, to be completed. So in this case, we want to have a book checked out. Um, we will most likely choose the standard catalog item option. The record producer is a way to create records within this table. So for example, if you wanted to register a new book, um, you could use the record producer to do so. And then the portal is a way to kind of create a website-like experience around your application for users users to interact or to kind of view details around your app. Uh, but in this case, let's go ahead and pick the standard catalog item. And let's begin. All right, so let's go ahead and create a new catalog item. I have here listed examples. So let's go ahead and paste these in here. I'm gonna call this V2 to separate it from the existing demo. And then we'll give this a quick short description. Hit continue. And then hopefully this is, does not take as long as the other thing. Hmm, goodness, today is not my day with my internet. <laughs> That's one of the downsides of um, cloud-based application is you're really dependent on that connection. And these uh, PDIs, because they're not production or really enterprise instances, they typically are underpowered compared to a true tra traditional instance. So let's go ahead and just cancel this. We'll, we'll do a walkthrough instead. So we'll walk through the existing items that that I've already created. So it's a good thing I've done that prior to this. So once you create the standard catalog item, this is what the form will look like once it loads in. Uh, 
Um, it's going to ask you for a couple of basic information. So for example, what is the name of your item? Give me the short description, um, as well as a larger description of that particular item. So I had ChatGPT generate all of these results for me. I've also provided a image for this item to help kind of stand it out in the catalog system, which we'll take a look a little later on. We will then set where we want this item to be requestable from. And so in this case, for our example today, I've just chosen the service catalog, catalog, and then I've chosen the library category. For questions, we can go ahead and add in different types of questions that we want to ask on our item. So for example, for checking out a book, we're going to want to know what kind of book we want to check out. And so I've created this book reference, which will point back to the table that we just created. So you can see here the question type is choice, and the subtype is record reference. And then you can name your label or your question, whatever you want. So you can say, um, you know, what book would you like to check out, just to make it more human readable. And then lastly, down here, we're going to make this required because we need to know what book you're checking out to process the item. And then in additional details here, we can go ahead and pick what table we want to reference this question from. And so since we've created a book table, I've gone ahead and referenced the book table that was just created. And then we want to only display books whose availability is currently set to available. So any books that are already checked out won't show up on this item. Let's go ahead and save that. And then moving down to, let's go straight down to fulfillment. Um, this is where you can then classify how you want your item to be fulfilled. And so typically this is empty and we would go and create a flow. A flow is kind of a way to automate some of this procurement or provisioning process for our items. Um, you can choose other things like workflows, but out of the box, um, I think the the best practice way to do it right now is to do a flow designer flow. So let's go ahead and continue, review, and submit. And we'll submit this item. Okay. So let's take a look at the flow that I've also created for this item. So this is part of the automation for getting the item procured or fulfilled. And so typically when you work with different organizations or different business stakeholders, there's some form of automation that needs to be done to ha have the item be completed, essentially. So you, maybe a task needs to get routed out. Maybe you need to make an API call to an application to execute some sort of action. And so this flow designer gives us kind of a low code way to build that mechanism or build those steps into the item itself. And so here I've named my item in a form or in a way that I know it's specifically tied to that specific catalog item. So you can see it's a requested item and it's called library book checkout. And then triggers, because it's part of a fulfillment process, um, you would tag it as a service catalog flow. And then on the item itself, you would then attach the, the flow to the item itself. Um, but you can also create other types of automation. So you can have triggers based on whenever a record is created or updated. So for example, if I were to create a new book, I could create an automation that would set certain values of that book record up in a certain way. Um, or you can do a scheduled job. So you can say this is going to be a weekly job or a daily job where every day it's going to check the status of the book and send an email. Maybe you have kind of a due date on that book when it should be returned. And if a book has been passed the due date, you can send a daily reminder to the person who checked the book out um, that they need to return the book to the desk. So those are other ideas that you can create from the flow designer. So starting from the top here, we use this action called get catalog variables from, and then this is the item that we're grabbing it from. And so this allows us to pick questions within the item itself to then use further down in our flow. Uh, in our case, in our questionnaire, in our, let's actually pull up the, um, the form. 
Uh, in our form, we have only one question, which is why book is the only thing that shows up on that list. So I hit request something. I go to library and I go to library book checkout. You can see here that we only have one book or one question listed on this form here. What book would you like to check out? And so we've select that. And what we're going to do is when someone says, I'm checking this book out, we're not going to do any approvals. We're going to make this really simple. We're just going to go to that book. So we're going to go ahead and update that record. And we're going to change the availability of that book from available to checked out. So that's the full automation of this particular flow here. And then once that is all said and done, um, the flow can be activated, and then it will then be an active flow that will be running kind of in production. So let's see that in action. So let's go ahead and click into, I've created a library management workspace to just kind of monitor the books for us. And let's pick a book that is currently available that can be checked out. Um, and let's go ahead and change it to, or let's go ahead and check that book out. So let's go to all my books. Um, let's do deep dive oceans. I like oceans. Let's take a look into this record here. You can see here that it is currently an available book. There's the title of the book. And so let's go ahead and click into the item that we've just pretend to create. And we're gonna go ahead and select what book would we like to check out. And you can see here that it will only show us two options here. And that's because of the five books that we have listed, only two of which are available. So it would only display whatever is currently available. Let's go ahead and select Deep Dives Ocean. And let's go ahead and request for this book. So let's go ahead and submit my request. And it's going to ask me, who would I like to submit this request on behalf of? And so we're going to just say System Administrator. Once the item has been submitted, the automation will kick in on the back end. Um, typically, this will be done via a task or via, um, you know, maybe API calls. But in this case, um, we're just editing the record, and you can see here that it went from available to checked out based on the automation flow that we've created for this particular item here. So let's go back into our app engine. So let's go back to App Engine Studio. Let's go ahead and close our flow down. And so lastly, I just wanted to kind of go over the workspace portion over here. So this one will be really quick. Um, so what you saw here, this interface here is called the workspaces. And so this is a way for you to kind of com compartmentalize different components or modules or applications within ServiceNow to a dedicated workspace for specific teams or fulfillers to work on. So the typical layout is you have kind of three buttons. One on the top here is called home. This will take you to kind of a dashboard view. And so as a librarian, I might be interested in books that are currently checked out, books that are um, almost due, books that should be returned soon. Uh, there could be different reports that I would like to see or edit or kind of add into the system. And so I can help the librarian by adding reports, by adding graphs, by adding different elements to this front page interface to make it easy for them to kind of work through their day and to see what is most important to them as they log into the system. The second button here is called list. And so if you have different ways that you want to classify work, so for example, you might have a, a list here to show you all the books that are checked out. Uh, maybe you have one that says, show me everything that's available. Maybe show the things that still need to be processed. Maybe you have a life cycle on books getting created, but they still need to be reviewed before they get shelved. Um, you can create all sorts of work queues within this section here. So agents or fulfillers or librarians in this case can log into the system, go through their daily list of things that need to be done and kind of crank through the work as, as efficiently as possible. And then lastly, down here is the analytics center. We're not going to dive too deep into this, but as you kind of develop your application, analytics becomes a critical component to kind of winning over the executive sponsors or the business stakeholders making this 
application critical to your process by giving them that ability to view into you know what's happening within their organization. And so as you get more advanced into your application, there may be KPIs or different elements that you want to measure within your application that you would then plan for and develop dashboards for. So we're not going to dive too deep into this because this is typically out of scope within like a small application, but um, it's definitely available if someone gets to that point in that level. Okay. And I think that is pretty much it. I was going to do a little bit more, but I think with the internet not behaving too well, um, I won't be able to show any of the enhancements that I kind of planned on making on the fly. Um, so we'll go ahead and just switch it back to if anyone has any questions. Uh, I think we can probably wrap this up. Just switch back to the slide here. So does anyone have any questions or want to dive into anything please, in particular? Please, um, please put them in the chat uh, or raise your hand and I will uh, open it up so you can talk. I had to shut you all down because of one nasty player. So forgive me for, uh, I just didn't want to have somebody keep interrupting. So. Is there anything else you could, uh, you see you're, you're having trouble generating it. So it's not, um, turning out to be quite what you wanted. <laughs> so I don't know what else to say. No questions, really? No questions, but here, but great demo. <laughs> great job, Steve, Kylie says. All right, well, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody, for the... Um, the 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 nasty buzzing thing that happened there. Uh, uh, that's the first time that's happened to me. I'll have you I'll have you know that usually people are not uh, joining this type of organization. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. Again, I'll repeat now that I have the full contingent here. Next Saturday is the um, kickoff day. Uh, please make sure you register for that if you're planning on participating. We have five challenges, and uh, this is uh, the fourth workshop. We will have the recording of this as well as decks and so forth. Uh, the previous three classes have their work. The decks are, uh, recordings are already up there. Uh, everything else is uh, moving along nicely now. Um, do you have any questions for me? about the workshop of the event. I'll field those now since we have a little extra time. All right, um, that, 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 I think that's a wrap then. Um, thank you, Stephen, uh, much appreciated. Um, please, please plan to join the, um, uh, oh, if everybody here, is everybody here join the, the, um, Slack workshop, if you haven't, uh, please check it. The link is on the web, the website. I'm trying to be, uh, not give too much information. <laughs> um, if you're Edmund, I would say if, uh, if you're gonna use it for the, uh, I'll let Steven answer this too, but if you are gonna use it for the event, you might wanna sign up now and play with it a little bit before you uh, try to use it for the hackathon. Agreed, Steven? Yeah, I would recommend visiting developer.servicenow.com, signing up for an account, spinning up a PDI, and then just kind of playing around with it um, to familiarize, uh, familiar si oh my goodness, to get yourself familiar with the application before trying to use it. Um, it has a lot of tribal knowledge around how to get certain things up and running, um, but it can be very quick once you get used to the interface and, and how it works. Any other links that might be beneficial to them, Stephen, to share? Oh, here's uh, yeah. what kind of projects post. would benefit from ServiceNow? So that's a good, that's a really good question. Oh. Thank you for asking that. Dean's actually on my team. So, <laughs> oh. Dean, we have a uh, 
somebody in the group. Okay, here's a bunch of links for you guys. Please, I mean, I'll hold off of uh, signing out so you can go grab some of those links. But um, I, I will answer that question because I think it is um, a helpful I dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so applications that, that kind of help or that are useful to use ServiceNow with is uh, typically things that have kind of a life cycle around it. If you want to design um, a very quick table structure and then build like a life cycle around that, um, those are good candidates to build applications. If you don't have very strong custom UI requirements, um, and you just have simple like table needs and kind of spitting up a, a, a state machine behind that application. I think ServiceNow is a very good fit for that. Um, it can also do really well in integrations. So if you get very familiar with integrating to REST APIs or using OLAF, OAuth to kind of connect your applications together, um, that's another thing that's um, really powerful to use within ServiceNow to kind of consolidate and build your applications from. Fantastic. Uh, Edmund, you've kind of joined a little late. I don't know if you were here before or not, but uh, Stephen, unfortunately, was experiencing some technical difficulties with the internet. And so some of his fancy stuff, um, uh, just uh, some of the cool stuff he was really to show us, couldn't show us because it just ground. I hate when that happens. So Stephen, what you showed was great. And we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Uh, hope to hope to have you present for us again in the future. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. That's not too bad. We were only supposed to go till seven thirty, so we we only started out fifteen minutes early. So yay! I get to go have uh, an early night tonight. Yay! <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. See, I hope to see you all next Saturday. Right. Well, that was really weird. <laughs> yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> and then they kept changing their name to mine so that I wouldn't know it was them, right? Yeah. At first, I was a little confused, but then you get that host thing next to you. So, yeah. Well, what, I real what I realized is that I had it so that people could name Rena. I have an open system. I don't oh. have certain things. There are certain things they can't do. Um, but so fortunately, there's a little secure in Zoom. There's a little security shield down at the bottom. I freaking shut everything down. I shut down the ability to use a white. As soon as somebody does that, I added a. I, I removed the whiteboard capability. I removed the um. This person. Uh, I removed the whiteboard capability. I, wore, I moved the all the things that you know can be. Uh, damaging. I had a friend once, you know, somebody got pulled up a whiteboard and started swearing on it and saying really Oh, nasty. yeah. Like, and I mean, not just like swearing, but like racist and, and you know, and sexist shit. So, uh, not that, because I'm not offended by swear words. <laughs> it's pretty hard to offend me by swear words, but racism or sexism I'm, and things like that, that pisses me off. So, um, Essentially, uh, I've not actually, so, and I get really pissed about this stuff. So I apologize. I had to shut everybody down, but that was the way to resolve it. And then I started checking to see when somebody was trying to come in to see whether or not they had registered. And, um, and then after that, once I shut everything down, I didn't care. They could come in. They couldn't do any harm. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that was a mighty unfortunate. But you're always gonna get some level of trolling, unfortunately, with you know events like this. But well, and that's good and, that you had it all under yeah, control. Yeah, and I try to keep it so that people can, um, uh, you know, 
register until the last minute because you know people go oh, oh to register and so I I open it up and you know and then I give links which may be not such a good thing so I don't know I had to think about that moving down the road but we'll see we'll see what that does I, I I'm gonna I, I'm going to make a note of the name Jake and then somebody was coming in trying to come in as JR. I rejected them. So I hope that. Oh, was... JR is actually one of my. Um, I'm sorry. You, after, <laughs> it's after, all good. After I rejected them because it would, they weren't registered at you. I saw a note from you that says, I, I know these people. And I was like, oops. Oh, that's all good. <laughs> sorry. And I might have <laughs> reported them too. So forgive me. Tell me he's in trouble <laughs> because of the J, right? jake right yeah yeah that's true I, it's better to be you know careful than you know yeah it's yeah. funny because we have a whole group uh customer yeah. group chat so as yeah. that was going on i saw the group chat going off and i think everyone's like oh i want to go watch that <laughs> yeah uh good times good time. it, it happens all right. Well, again, we only ended up ten minutes early in the sense, so I, I hope you, I hope you weren't disappointed in what you were able to present. Um, no, I, I think it was good. I it's just unfortunate that the PDI was not working. I think if I do this next time, I'm gonna steal one of our demo instances and use that because that's a little bit more reliable. Yeah, more robust. So, all right. Well, thank you again. Um, oh, I, I, I should have removed that all this from that recording.